Okay, boys and girls, so today we are reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and we're up to page 170, chapter 10, The Rogue Bludger. Since the disastrous episode of the Pixies, Professor Lockhart had not brought live creatures to class. Instead, he read passages from his books to them and sometimes reenacted some of the more dramatic bits. He usually picked Harry to help him with these reconstructions. So far, Harry had been forced to play a simple Trans Transylvanian villager whom Lockhart had cured of a babbling curse, a yeti with a head cold, and a vampire who had been unable to eat anything except lettuce since Lockhart had dealt with him. Harry had hauled Harry was hauled to the front of the class during their very next Defence Against the Arts lesson, this time acting a werewolf. If he hadn't had a very good reason for keeping Lockhart in a good mood, he would, ha he would have now refused to do it. Nice loud howl, Harry, exactly. And then, if you'll believe it, I pounced like this, slammed him to the floor, thus. With one hand, I managed to hold him down. With my other, I put my wand to his throat. I then screwed up my remaining strength and performed the immensely complex, homorphous charm. He let out a, pi a piteous moan. Go on, Harry, higher than that, good. The fur vanished and the fangs shrank and he turned back into a man. Simple yet effective and another village and, and another village will remember me forever as the hero who delivered them from the monthly terror of werewolf attacks. The bell rang and Lockhart got to his feet. Homework, comp compose a poem about my defeat of the Wagga Wagga werewolf. Signed copies of Magical Me to the author of the best one. The class began to leave. Harry returned to the back of the room where Ron and Hermione were waiting. Ready, Harry muttered. Wait till everyone goes, said Hermione nervously. All right. She approached Lockhart's desk, a piece of paper clutched tightly in her hand. Harry and Ron right behind her. Uh, P Professor Lockhart, Hermione stammered. I wanted to, to, to get this book out of the library just for background reading. She held out a piece of paper, her hand shaking slightly. But the thing is, it's in the restricted section of the library, so I need a teacher to sign for it. I'm sure it would help me understand the way that, that what you say in, in gadding the, with ghouls about slow acting venoms. Ah, gadding with ghouls, said Lockhart, taking the note from Hermione and smiling widely at her. Possibly my very favourite book. You enjoyed it? Oh, yes, said Hermione eagerly. So clever, the way you trapped the last one with a, with a tea strainer. Well, I'm sure no one will mind me giving the best student in the year a little extra help, said Lockhart warmly, and he pulled out an enormous peacock quill. Yes, nice, isn't it? He said, misreading the revolt. The revolted look on Ron's face. I usually save it for book signings. He scrawled an enormous loopy signature on the note and handed it back to Hermione. So, Harry, said Lockhart, while Hermione folded the note with fumbling fingers and slipped it into her bag. Tomorrow's the first Quidditch match of the season, I believe. Gryffindor against Slytherin, is it not? I hear you're a useful player. I was a seeker too. I was asked to try for the national squad, but preferred to de dedicate my life to the eradication of dark forces. Still, if ever you feel a need for a little private training, don't hesitate to ask. Always happy to pass on my expertise to less able players. Harry made an indistinct noise in his throat and then hurried off after Ron and Hermione. I don't believe it he said, as the three of them examined the signature on the note. He didn't even look at the book we wanted. That's because he's a brainless git, said Ron. But who cares? We've got what we needed. 
He is not a brainless git, said Hermione shrilly, as they half ran towards the library. Just because he said you were the best student in the year. They dropped their voices as they entered the muffled stillness of the library. Madame Pince, the librarian, was a thin, irritable woman who looked like an underfed vulture. Most potenta potions, she repeated suspiciously, trying to make the note from Hermione, trying to take the note from Hermione, but Hermione wouldn't let go. I was wondering if I could keep it, she said breathlessly. Oh, come on, said Ron, wrenching it from her grasp and thrust, thrusting it at, at Madame Pince. We'll get you another autograph. Lockhart will sign anything if it stands still long enough. Madame Pince held the note up to the light as though determined to detect a forgery, but it passed the test. She stalked away between the lofty shelves and returned several minutes later, carrying a large and mouldy looking book. Hermione put it carefully into her bag and they left trying not to walk too quickly or look too guilty. Five minutes later, they were barricaded in Moaning Myrtle's out of order bathroom once again. Hermione had overridden Ron's objections by pointing out that it was the last place anyone in their right minds would go, so they were guaranteed some privacy. Moaning Myrtle was crying noisily in her cubicle, but they were ignoring her and she them. Hermione opened Moster Potenta Potions carefully, and the three of them bent over the damp, spotted pages. It was clear from the glance why it belonged to the restricted section. Some of the potions had effects almost gr too gruesome to think about. And there were some very unpleasant illustrations, which included a man who seemed to have been turned inside out and a witch sprouting several pairs of arms out of her head. Here it is, said Hermione excitedly, as she found the page headed the Polyjuice Potion. It was decorated with drawings of people halfway through transforming into their into other people. Harry sincerely hoped the artist had imagined the looks of intense pain on their faces. This is the most complicated potion I've ever seen, said Hermione, as they scanned the recipe. Lacewing flies, leeches, fluxweed and knotgrass, she murmured, running her fingers down the list of ingredients. Well, they're easy enough. They're, the student, they're in the student store cupboard. We can help ourselves. Oh, look, powdered horn of bickhorn. Don't know where we're going to get that. Shredded skin of bloom slang. That'll be tricky too. And of course, a bit of whoever we want to change into. Excuse me, said Ron sharply. What do you mean a bit of whoever we're changing into? I'm drinking nothing with crab's toenails in it. Hermione continued as though she hadn't heard him. We don't have to worry about that yet, though, because we add those bits last. Ron turned, speech, turned speechless to Harry, who had another worry. Do you realise how much we're going to have to steal, Hermione? Shredded skin of bloom slang? That's definitely not in the student's cupboard. What are we, do what are we gonna do? Break into Snape's private stores? I don't know if this is a good idea. Hermione shut the book with a snap. Well, if you two are going to chicken out, fine, she said. There were bright pink patches on her cheeks and her eyes were brighter than usual. I don't want to break the rules, you know. I think threatening muddle, muggle bones is far worse than brewing up a difficult potion. But... If you don't want to find out if it's Malfoy, I'll go straight to Madame Pince now and hand the book back in. I never thought I'd see the day when you'd be persuading us to break the rules, said Ron. All right, we'll do it, but not toenails, okay? How long will it take to make anyway, said Harry, as Hermione looked happier, oh, has um, Hermione looked, looking happier, opened the book again. Well, as the fluxweed has got to be picked, 
at the full moon and the lace wings have got to be stewed for 21 days, I'd say it'd be ready in about a month if we can get all the ingredients. A month, said Ron. Malfoy could have attacked half the Muggleborns in the school by then. But Hermione's eyes narrowed dangerously again and she added swiftly, but it's the best plan we've got. So full steam ahead, I say. However, while Hermione was checking that the coast was clear for them to leave the bathroom, Ron muttered to Harry, it'll be a lot less hassle if you can just knock Malfoy off his broom tomorrow. Harry woke early on Saturday morning and lay for a while thinking about the coming Quidditch match. He was nervous mainly at the thought of what Wood would say if Gryffindor lost, but also at the idea of facing a team mounted on the fastest racing brooms gold could buy. He had never wanted to beat Slytherin so badly. After half an hour of lying there with his insides churning, he got up, dressed, and went down to breakfast early, where he found the rest of Gryffindor team huddled at the long, empty table, all looking uptight, not speaking much. As 11 o'clock approached, the whole school started to make its way down to the Quidditch Stadium. It was a muggy sort of day with a hint of thunder in the air. Ron and Hermione came hurrying over to wish Harry good luck as he entered the changing rooms. The team pulled on their scarlet Gryffindor robes, then sat down to listen to Wood's usual pre-match pe pep talk. Slytherin have got better brooms than us, he said, he began. No point denying it, but we've got better people on our brooms. We've trained harder than they have. We've all been flying in, the we in all weathers. Too true, muttered George Weasley. I haven't been properly dry since August. And we're going to make them rue the day that, that they let that little bit of slime Malfoy busy his, buy his way into their team. Chest heaving with emotion, Wood turned to Harry. It'll be down to you, Harry, to show them that the seeker has, has to have something more than a rich father. Get to that snitch before Malfoy or die trying. Harry, because we've got to win today. We've got to. So no pressure, Harry, said Fred, winking at him. As they walked out onto the pitch, a roar of noise greeted them, mainly cheers, because Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were anxious to see Slytherin beaten. But the Slytherins in the crowd made their boos and hisses heard too. Madam Hooch, the Quidditch teacher, asked Flint and Wood to shake hands, which they did, giving each other threatening stares and gripping rather harder than was necessary. On my whistle, said Madam Hooch. Three, two, one. With a roar from the crowd to speed them upwards, the 14 players rose towards the leaden sky. Harry flew higher than any of them, squinting around for the snitch. All right there, Scarhead, yelled Malfoy, shooting underneath him as though to show off speed of his broom. Harry had no time to reply. At, at that very moment, a heavy black bludger came pelting towards him. He avoided it so narrowly that he felt it ruffle his hair as it passed. Close one, Harry, said George, streaking past him with his club in his hand, ready to knock the bludger back towards a Slytherin. Harry saw George give the bludger a powerful whack in the direction of Adrian Pusey, but the bludger changed direction in midair and shot straight for Harry again. Harry dropped quickly to avoid it, and George managed to hit it hard towards Malfoy. Once again, the bludger swerved like a boomerang and shot at Harry's head. Harry put on a burst of speed and zoomed towards the other end of the pitch. He could hear the bludger whistling along behind him. What was going on? 
Bludgers never concentrated on one player like this. It was their job to try and unseat as many people as possible. Fred Weasley was waiting for the bludger at the other end. Harry ducked. As Fred swung at the bludger with all his might, the bludger was knocked off course. That's done it, Fred yelled happily, but he was wrong. As though it was magnetically attracted towards Harry, the bludger pelted after him once more and Harry was forced to fly at full speed. It had started to rain. Harry felt heavy drops fall onto his face, splattering onto his glasses. He didn't have a clue what was going on in the rest of the game until he heard Lee Jordan, who was commentating, say, Slytherin leads 60 points to zero. The Slytherin superior brooms were clearly doing their jobs. And meanwhile, the mad bludger was doing all it could to knock Harry out of the air. Fred and George were now flying so close to him on either side that Harry could see nothing at all, except their flailing arms and had no chance to look for the snitch, let alone catch it. Someone's tampered with this bludger, Fred grunted, swinging his bat with all his might at it as it launched a new attack on Harry. We need time out, said George, trying to signal to Wood and stop the bludger breaking Harry's nose at the same time. Wood had obviously got the message. Madam Hooch's whistle rang out and Harry, Fred and George dived for the ground, still trying to avoid the mad bludger. What's going on? said Wood as the Gryffindor team huddled together while Slytherins in the crowd jeered. We're being flattened. Fred, George, where were you when that bludger stopped Angelina scoring? We were 20 feet above her stopping the other bludger. Murdering Harry, Oliver, said George angrily. Someone's fixed it. It won't leave Harry alone. It hasn't gone for anyone else all game. The Slytherins must have done something to it. But the bludgers have been locked in Madame Hooch's office since our last practice. And there was nothing wrong with them then, said Wood anxiously. Madame Hooch was walking towards them. Over her shoulder, Harry could see the Slytherin team jeering and pointing in his direction. Listen, said Harry, as she came nearer and nearer. With you two flying around me all the time, the only way I'm going to catch a snitch is if it flies up my sleeve. Go back to the rest of the team and let me deal with the rogue one. Don't be thick, said Fred. It'll take your head off. Wood was looking from, from Harry to the Weasleys. Oliver, this is mad, said Alicia Spinnet angrily. You can't let Harry deal with that thing on his own. Let's ask for an inquiry. If we stop now, we'll have to forfeit the match, said Harry. And we're not losing to Slytherin just because of a mad bludger. Come on, Oliver, tell them to leave me alone. This is all your fault, George said angrily to Wood. Get the snitch or die trying. What a stupid thing to tell him. Madam Hooch had joined them. Ready to resume play? She asked Wood. Wood looked at the determined look on Harry's face. All right, he said. Fred, George, you heard Harry. Leave him alone and let him deal with the bludger on his own. The rain was falling more heavily now. On Madam Hooch's whistle, Harry kicked hard into the air and heard the telltale whoosh of the bludger behind him. Higher and higher, Harry climbed. He looped and swooped, spiraled, zigzagged and rolled. Slightly dizzy, he nevertheless kept his eyes wide open. Rain was speckling his glasses and ran up his nostrils as he hung upside down, avoiding another fierce dive from the bludger. He could hear laughter from the crowd. He knew he must look very stupid, but the rogue bludger was heavy and could change direction as quickly as he could. He began a kind of roller coaster ride around the edges of the stadium squinting through the silver sheets of rain into the Gryffindor goalposts where Adrian Pusey was trying to get past Wood. A whistling in Harry's ear told him the bludger had just missed him again. He turned right 
over and, and sped in the opposite direction. Training for the ballet, Potter, yelled Malfoy, as Harry was forced to do a stupid kind of twirl in mid-air to dodge the bludger. Off Harry fled, the bludger trailing a few feet behind him, and then glaring back at Malfoy in hatred. He saw it, the golden snitch. It was hovering inches above Malfoy's left ear, and Malfoy, busy laughing at Harry, hadn't seen it. For an agonising moment, Harry hung in mid-air, not daring to speed towards Malfoy in case he looked up and saw the snitch. Wham! He had stayed still a second too long. The bludger had hit him at last, smashed into his elbow, and Harry felt his arm break. Dimly, dazed by the searing pain in his arm, he slid sideways on his rain drenched broom, one knee crooked over it. His right arm dangling useless at his side, the bludger came pelting back for a second attack, this time aiming at his face. Harry swerved out of the way, one idea firmly lodged in his numb brain. Get to Malfoy. Through a haze of rain and pain, he dived for the shimmering, sneering face below him and saw its eyes widen with fear. Malfoy thought Harry was attacking him. What the? He gasped, careering out of Harry's way. Harry took his remaining hand off the broom and made a wild snatch. He felt his fingers close to the cold, close on the cold snitch, but was now only gripping the broom with his legs. And there was a yell from the crowd below as he headed straight for the ground, trying not to pass out. With a splattering thud, he hit the mud and rolled off his broom. His arm was hanging at a very strange angle, riddled with pain. He heard as though, he heard as though from a distance a good deal of whistling and shouting. He focused on the snitch, clutched in his good hand. Aha, he said vaguely, we've won. And he fainted. Okay, boys and girls, we are going to stop there. And that is at the bottom of page 181. So we've got 10 more pages to go in this chapter. So next time when we read, it'll be from page 182 of chap chapter 10, The Rogue Bludger.